Okay. Uh, all right. Thanks, everyone. So yeah, I'll uh, so I'll talk today about some uh, results on uh, on a bunch of uh, models here. So I uh, yeah, I chronium them here. Uh, okay. Most importantly, this is a joint work with the two very bright people, Qian Yu. He was at Princeton, and now he's moving to Santa Barbara. Uh, actually, I just realized I don't know if he signed the contract yet, so maybe, maybe <laughs> let's replace it with a question mark. And Yu Zhou Gu, who was a student at MIT, he's here. So he's, he's moving to IAS uh, next year. And actually, after that, he's coming here to CMSA. So, um, so this is, he's kind of local, future local guy. Uh, yeah, so before yesterday, I was planning to start my talk with this slide. Okay, let me just go. Uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Right, so I just wanted to start here and just say, okay, in my group over the last three years, you know, we proved a bunch of things and I just wanted to walk, you know, the audience for this like quickly just to give a survey of what's happening. Then yesterday I realized there's not just like two, first two rows, but there's a bunch of, you know, a lot more people. So I added a few slides in the beginning. Hopefully this will be helpful for others so, <laughs> as well. So, so I'll try to be, you know, say something for non-experts and something for experts. Maybe this will be a failure for both, but I don't know. Also for young. Yes, something for special for you <laughs> as well. Right. Uh, okay, anyway, so yeah, so let's, uh, let's uh, get started. Uh, so first of all, I'm going to talk about uh, loosely speaking about the topic of community detection. So, you know, there are lots of interesting graphs and we basically, by community detection, we mean identifying subgraphs with a slightly larger edge density than, than, you know, than usual. So the question is how to find these communities. You know, there are lots of ideas in the literature. I've been working on stochastic block model for maybe three, four years. And then uh, this, uh, this, uh, this winter, I, I participated in some um, data science challenge by the Broad Institute. And you know, we had to do some community detection there uh, for real. And then I realized that actually that community doesn't know anything about what we are talking about in this rule. They all use these two algorithms, Lovain and Leyden, and there's absolutely no theory about them. So, you know, that's, uh, I was a bit surprised, but anyway, so there's like this, these two uh, real world algorithms which are used. Uh, we're not going to talk about this. We're going to talk about theoretical setup to understand these problems. Okay, so what's the problem? The problem is that you see this graph, you want to get this graph, right? So you see some graph without any labels, just a gray thing, right? And you want to identify some clusters, right? So that's a, that's a general thing, the general topic here. Okay, so, uh, I mean, as I said, many people look at this in many different ways. So there is a particular setting, which is called stochastic block model. I'll introduce it in the next slide. You know, it, will, it got a sort of, a, a, a second life after this uh, very influential paper by Dessel and Floran and uh, others, uh, which uh, basically produced a lot of uh, statistical physics predictions, which lots of us are uh, trying to prove since then. So what is a stochastic block model? So symmetric QSBM with parameters A and B is defined as follows. So we have N vertices. First of all, it's a, it's a, top, it's a question about graphs, right? So we have N vertices. Each is going to assign a random uniform uh, label from uh, alphabet of size Q. Uh, and then after we assign those labels, we generate a random graph G with the, each edge, which is A over N if the two labels are the same, right? And uh, B over N otherwise. So as I said, I mean, mostly we're interested in the situation when A is bigger than B. So you have, you know, two community or Q communities, right? And inside community, you have slightly higher density, right? Okay, so then, your goal is to look at the look at the matrix. Sorry, did I say yeah? Okay, you you see the graph G right, and you're trying to identify the communities, right? And uh, I mean, there is some kind of maximization of row permutations. Why? Because of course, uh, I mean, the, the setting is completely asymmetric up to relabeling of communities, right? So you basically, if you provide the labeling, we we compute the best uh, possible relabel, which maximizes the uh, fraction of correctly identified labels, right? So this is the goal of this of this whole area, right? So this is what's called stochastic block model, and there is stochastic block model with survey where you also observe for each for each uh, node you observe its value through some uh, kind of uh, a noisy channel, right? So that's uh, so that's just a notation. You don't need to worry about the setting uh, until much later. Okay, so here's the picture, right? So I mean, again, so this is a random graph and then there's like these two communities slightly denser inside and outside and your algorithmic question is to find this cut, right? 
to maximize to minimize the number of edges across the communities. Okay, so let's compute. So this is a completely well. I gave you a probability distribution, right? Of uh, of uh, x and g. So we can try to marginalize, right? So we know g. Let's try to compute probability of x given x. So if you do that, you will get. If I didn't make a mistake, something like this. So you'll get a standard Gibbs measure on a set of x's, which looks like this. So there's going to be um, the pots, uh, the pots uh, Hamiltonian, which is basically uh, sums over all edges in the graph. Okay, the graph turns out to be locally tree-like, right? It's a local Galton-Watson tree with some parameter, uh, d given here. So, right, and then uh, the Potts Hamiltonian uh, increases the energy uh, between, you know, depending on whether two uh, labels are matching or not matching uh, on edges. And then there is the correction term, which I called mean field. It sums over all known edges. But the point is that this, this kind of term is small because there's like one over n. Thing, right, so we can mostly, you know, uh, there is influential paper by Elkanan where basically what they prove is that this model, which is not Pot's model on a random graph, first of all, G is not an Erdos-Renyi graph, right? It's some other graph, but locally it looks uh, like a tree, and locally this uh, probability distribution you can ignore this. It locally looks like Pot's model, right? Up to some uh, factors, and then locally I mean neighborhoods of size, say little of square root n, right? Okay, so right, so there is some other technical thing which is uh, which we need to know, namely that there is also some conditional independence. Basically, if you are interested in distribution of this little neighborhood, uh, then it only interacts with the outside through the value on the boundary. This is exactly true for pots, but the, basically this is saying that this mean field part doesn't contribute much. Oh, I see. I see. I see. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, I'm not used. I'm a yeah. I'm a peasant. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Maybe that's why my evaluations are so low. Right. Learn this. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. So. Um, right. Okay. Anyway. So. Right. So let's understand the POTS model on a locally tree-like graph now. Right. So that's what I wanted to. So basically, I'm motivating this. Uh, right. So I mean, if you see G, you want to do posterior inference. Posterior is super complicated. It's not locally. Uh, is the graph is not uh, Erdos-Renyi, right? But it locally looks like Erdos-Renyi. And then you're trying to do uh, inference with respect to Pot's model. So how does the Pot's model on the tree look like? Well, it has an amazing description, which Elkanon already told us about. It's called broadcasting on trees, right? So so here is a how to understand Pot's model on a locally tree-like graph. So you first generate uh, right. So there is a tree, right, with some branching uh, happening. Let's say degree d. Uh, okay, so you you assign the root to be uniform uh, uniform uh, color from Q. Oh, sorry, I keep doing the same thing. <laughs> yeah, so you assign the root from uh, Q colors, right? And then for every edge, so given this root, right, you have two edges in my picture. You pass this edge through this random transformation, which I call a channel, right? This is called Pot's channel, right? So basically, it outputs. So across every edge, right, the signal travels with noise, right? So it gets flipped with some probability, right, to one of the uniformly chosen colors, right, or gets uh, carried through with some other probability, right? Okay, so this is the process, right? So you go like this down to very bottom, right, and you have exponentially many variables here, each of which has exponentially small signal about the top, right? So the question of the broadcasting entries and the beauty of broadcasting entries, right, is which of these two effects wins, right? Exponential killing of the information or the copying, right? That's the that's the funny part. Okay, so, right, so again, so uh, the question is estimating the root given the, given the, uh, the labels of the, of the leaves, right? So now, as Elkanan already explained yesterday, right, there is a, this algorithm called belief propagation, which is efficient, right? It's just iterative algorithm. I mean, it runs, starts from the bottom and then just progressively goes up and computes exactly the posterior on the, on the top, right? So very nice stuff. And then the question is, what does it compute, right? So we want to understand performance of this iterative algorithm when it's initialized from random data, right? So that's the problem here. The algorithm is iterative, and then we have uh, random mm -hmm. data, right? But that's what, uh, okay, so lots of smart people thought about this. So Kesten Stigum proved the following amazing fact that if D lambda square is bigger than one, then you can reconstruct the root. Actually not, and as Elkanan said, not even using belief propagation, basically by doing majority vote on the counts. 
uh, okay. So then there's, there was a 30 years break and then uh, this physicist proved that, that kessler Stingenbaut is tight for two communities. Uh, Andrea wrote this paper almost 20 years ago with a bunch of conjectures and some proofs. I should say I'm not very uh, fair here. There's some proofs as well on that paper, but uh, there are conjectures on the tightness of KS, uh, but not, not proofs about tightness of KS, right? So, so um, the big question in this whole area is when is Kirsten Stigum bound, is D lambda square equals one, when is the actual threshold for reconstruction? Okay, and then, then there's partial work uh, resolving this. Okay, so that's the summary of broadcasting on trees. Now here is how, now every time I give this channel, I have to define like, why do I care about this question, right? Because people who know me, they probably understand that uh, I don't care about actually recovering, you know, social communities, right? And stuff like this. <laughs> I don't have graphs, I don't have grants on this. So, you know, I don't have to pretend I like this. What I like about this is that these are really cool questions about channels, right? So I'm an information theorist. I think about these questions as questions about channels. So we beat to death question about memoryless channels, right? Over the hundred years or 60, 70 years, right? Now, these problems present us new problems about channels, right? That's why I love it. Okay, so here's how we think about this, right? So we think about broadcasting on trees as a recursive operation on channels, right? So I give you this channel, which takes this bit and propagates it down to the bottom, right? And then there's this operation, which constructs uh, a M2 channel from M1 channel, right? By doing this operation, you start with a bit, you pass it through this, right? You copy it twice, you pass it through noisy channels, and then you continue through the previous. Uh, for the previous thing, right? We call this, right? So we call, first of all, the MK is the channel from here to level K, right? And then you can write down that, you know, MK plus one is this channel, which is, we call BP of MK. Uh, so, right, so uh, this operator is going to be everywhere in my talk, right? So this is, I call it BP operator. It's an operator on channels. So I'll spend a little more time on it again, right? So how does BP M work? So it takes your channel M, which for me in this case is a channel going from here down, right? It applies, so this is a composition of channels, right? So I first, I input query message, right? It passes for first through this Poisson, uh, POTS channel, right? And then it passes through this input channel M, and then this asterisk D means convolution, right? So you just copy this operation D times, right? So this is the, this is the, right? So. So asterisk corresponds to taking, right? So M asterisk N means you take input, you pass it through M, you pass it through N, and then you get two of these outputs, right? So this is what it means, right? So, okay, so this is, I mean, we call it convolution because if you compute log likelihood ratio, right? Then it corresponds to convolution of measures, right? That's, uh, that's why we call it, yes. One of this, yes. I mean, yeah. Something like this, yeah. So you're saying, yes, that's right, yes. Right, right. Because so I'm using the fact that this is the fractal thing, right? Actually, it's constructed from the same thing up, right? Yeah, so for alkaline, this is important because for me, all my trees are, are produced in the same way. Right, but Elkadan actually studied things like tree, where tree is given to you, right? It's not random, right? It's not, it's not uh, homogeneous. So for me, tree is generated always in the same manner at each layer, right? So maybe that's uh... okay. So right. So and then the reconstruction corresponds to the following interesting question, which we call BP fixed point, right? Whether this BP operator has a non-trivial fixed point or not, right? So so basically, we are trying to solve this 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 problem, right? We have BP M equals M. Right. This is all. This always has a solution where channel M is trivial. It just destroys all knowledge. Always outputs one as the as the output. Right. BP of trivial channel is trivial. So this is a called trivial fixed point. Right. The question is: Is there any other channel which satisfies the fixed point? Okay. So. Right. So as I explained, so weak recovery in SBM, meaning ability to produce some estimate of the communities corresponds to reconstruction problem on trees. Okay, in what way it corresponds? We only know one direction rigorously. So it says that if you have non-reconstruction for broadcasting on trees, then weak recovery is impossible. So this is a rigorous reduction. Reduction in the opposite direction does not exist, but it's kind of felt that, you know, it's, it's almost, uh, almost needed for that. 
Although I think there are counterexamples for like a disassortative case. Okay, so in any case, so this is a rigorous thing, right? So we know weak recovery requires uh, reconstruction on trees, right? Definitely. Okay, so here's another question. So sometimes you're interested in whether in stochastic block model you can reconstruct efficiently the at the optimum fraction, right? So you want to reconstruct optimal fraction of communities. So this corresponds to the question which we call stability of BP fixed point. And stability of BP fixed point means that from any two channels, you start iterating this self map, right, on channels. So from any two channels you start, right, the picture looks like this. It just converges to the same point, right? So if this holds, then what do we know? So that's again another paper of Elkanan show that if you have stability of BP fixed point and somebody already has some recovery algorithm, typically spectral, right, then you can, uh, by some, you know, massaging this algorithm and so on, you can get optimal recovery algorithm, right? Um, and also efficient algorithm. So that's, that's another interesting question. So the third question is what we call mutual information. Okay, so, so I defined to you this crazy distribution, right? The planted model PXG. So you might want to evaluate how much information per label does this have, right? So how much does the graph give you information about the labels, right? The labels have entropy to uh, n, right? Uh, n log two. And then the question is like, okay, how, the, how much of this n log two does the graph give me? Okay, so for that question, I'm not going to explain for now, but you need to know boundary relevance uh, property. So what is boundary relevance? This is basically you define BP operator with a slight twist, right? After passing uh, your D copies over the M noise channels, you also add extra survey information, right? So you also observe the route through some channel W. And boundary relevance means that even this operator has unique non-trivial fixed point, right? So if, if that's the case, so, uh, right. So what we proved in 2021 with Emmanuel, Elisabetta, and Udrow is that if you have boundary irrelevance, then there is a uh, stochastic block model uh, formula, formula for uh, mutual information. And I wanted to spend a couple of slides. So for those of you who didn't see this, because to me, this is a magical moment. Why? Because SBM is this global thing, right? Again, so there are people, Flora and Andrea here, right, who work their entire life on this. But to me, this is still magical that, you know, broadcasting on trees is a local thing, right? My entire talk is going to be about local things, local computations, BP, how do you do this local inference and so on, right? This IXG is a global object, right? So it should depend on loop structure and everything in the graph, right? Who knows how it behaves, right? And it turns out that this, this proof uh, gives me ability to reason about this global quantity through local arguments. I mean, to me, this always looks, so there are a couple of examples like this in, in in, in information theory in, in this business as well. But uh, I wanted to show you the really easy proof of this. Uh, so that's sort of my one contribution uh, to the newcomers. Okay, so here's how we're going to do it. So this is my stochastic block model, right? And what I will do is, so this is what this is my data, right? I'm now playing a, a, a virtual game, right? I'm saying, okay, suppose now an Oracle gives me survey, right? It reveals to me epsilon fraction of nodes, right? So just the oracle tells me, here's the epsilon fraction of nodes for you, right? Okay, so we're going to call this omega epsilon. Okay, so then one way to compute this entropy of xn given g, right, of this vector of labels given the graph is I can, I can compute it, you know, I can add this observations, the side information, right? And when, when I have full observation, there is no entropy in x, right? When I have epsilon equals zero, then this is just my original thing, right? So then I can integrate a derivative from zero to one in epsilon, right? So this is called interpolation method here, right? And the magical thing, okay, this is not magical. I mean, this is trivial computation, right? Everybody can do this, right? So you just, I mean, you do some chain rule and blah, blah, and then you get this expression, right? So that somehow, right? So you started with the, the goal of computing this global object. Now you're integrating something local, right? Or, or sort of more, more seemingly simpler, right? Now you just need to compute the entropy of a single vertex, right? But of course, this is still a global object, right? Because how well you can recover this guy depends on the entire graph, right? Maybe there's some long loop inference you need to do, right, to, to do this. Okay, so let's let's look at this h of x1 given g, right? So, so it turns out, and this is, the, uh, this is the boundary relevance property, that when you condition on this survey information, 
somehow it breaks all the long long range dependencies. So here is what happens. Okay, so we take this x one. Okay, this is really against my nature not to point with the arm. Okay, so this is x one. This is a little neighborhood of depth log n. As we said, it's a tree like, right? So now I'm computing this entropy x one given g, and the survey, right? So if I reduce conditioning, I increase entropy, right? So I gave you all of the survey before. Now let me give you less information. I'm only going to give you connectivity structure inside this neighborhood K and also on the survey at depth K. Yes. Oh, this means except the root. Except, except. Yeah, I mean, this is just the fact of this. Maybe I made a mistake, but I think this is a tilde one here. So it's, uh, yeah. So it's, uh, yeah, but it's not important. I mean, if you add this, if you add one here, then it just changes this by a factor or minus epsilon or something. Yeah, so it's the same thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, excellent question, right? So, so this part is completely obvious, right? You're just reducing the amount of information, so this increases entropy, right? So this part is the tricky part, which is the uh, sort of uh, uh, is the achievement of uh, Elkanan's uh, work, right? At the coupling to trees, right? Because uh, you can write instead of if you add to the conditioning the boundary, right? If you add to the conditioning the boundary, then it kind of tr it kind of kills the value of all the information outside, right? Because it's locally Markovian, right? Approximately again, there is this approximation, right? But now notice what happened, right? So if we have boundary irrelevance, what does it mean? It means that on that tree, right? Let me let me go back. We have a picture of a tree somewhere. Right, on this tree, right, I play two games. One is I give you no information about the leaves, right? But there is a survey, epsilon survey coming at each node, right? And the other one, I give you full information about the leaves, right? If there is a unique fixed point, this means when you iterate starting from uh, trivial information here or from perfect information, you arrive at the same value, right? So that's the magic here that somehow providing epsilon survey throughout the tree completely kills the value of, 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 of you know, of, uh, of like learning all of this. So I, when the first time I discovered this, I mean, because this problem originated in Elkanan's work on uh, phylogenetic trees, right? I, I, I called it mentally as like, you should pay archeologists, not biologists, right? Because if archeologists can provide to you, right? Some epsilon fraction of, uh, Okay, I know it's a bad analogy, but <laughs> like then you don't need to know perfectly this, right? So, anyways, but right. So this is the point, right? So this is completely mind-boggling property. I mean, I'm still so, so, getting by localizing the thing by taking integral with respect to the of channels. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it appeared in uh, in Andrea's work called subadditivity of entropy. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's right. That's right. No, the the, the idea is completely is completely standard. It's just that I'm saying, like, to me, it's mind boggling, you know, that it works so well. Right. And, uh, and of course, it requires proving this uh, boundary relevance, right? So once you have boundary relevance, then you know that, you know, inference from, uh, from the bottom, uh, from the perfect leaves or from no leaves gives you exactly the same, gives you exactly the same. Uh, sorry, this is missing BP infinity, right? Because this is, uh, right. right. So, um, Right, so this is how you prove it, right? Because then you get these two values are the same and then you get, uh, okay. So anyway, so this is, this is the end of my sort of introduction for uh, non-experts. So I just wanted you guys to, to convince you that, you know, there is SBM problem, which is somehow very convincing. That is a, is a cool topic, right? And then there's broadcasting and trees, which is, you know, a little less uh, convincing that it's related to some of the recovery or reconstruction, but there's like a one-to-one -one more or less, I mean, not one-to-one, -one, but there's strong, uh, Strong connection. So throughout throughout uh, the rest of the talk, except for the last part, I will talk about broadcasting on trees, and I will try to show you what we know about reconstruction, stability, and boundary relevance. Okay. So, okay. So now this is the slide which I wanted to start with, right? So what did we do in the last uh, three years? Okay. So for the so first of all, more, the strongest results we have is for uh, binary SBM. So this is the result that uh, that uh, I wanted to talk at the end. So we showed that all of this properties, BP uniqueness, BP stability, and boundary relevance hold for uh, in all regimes for, for 2SBM. So previously it was known in some regimes, now we know uh, exactly. So we kind of know how overlap scales near criticality. 
we know uh, we have an algorithm for computing this fixed point, you know, with arbitrary precision. Um, so for QSBM, I think we currently have in some regimes best no, best bounds on non reconstruction. Uh, we have BP uniqueness, BP stability, and boundary relevance. Unfortunately, not in all parameters, but only in certain regime. But we also know that it doesn't hold. So there is okay. So in this build, in this business, as you remember from Alcanon's talk yesterday, right? So there is this when you go to beyond q equals three, right, to four, five, and above, then there is this strange regime where keston stegen bound is no longer sharp for reconstruction. So there exists a, reg a region where reconstruction is possible, but not by counting, a, not by counting, and not by any efficient algorithm conjecturally. Right, so, so, so we prove that in that phase, you always have no boundary irrelevance, which means that this method of localizing, uh, right, by doing, the, by doing the interpolation does not work there, provably, right? So that's, that's the interesting, again, so I'm, I'm sort of, uh, right, so in some sense, to me, this is the normal situation, right? Like the, the, the fact that it works here is a little bit anomalous. Um, Right, so then there is a there is a result on robust non reconstruction for Q coloring. So this is something that uh, I mean is only for technically like Elkanan can appreciate this, uh, I guess. Uh, right, so we also know how to compute BP infinity for QSBM, um, and then very recently uh, we also started understanding the hypergraph SBM, which is something I will talk at, uh, in, in a second about and there we basically showed that for three and four this is not alphabet this is binary model for binary models right so far ks was always tight but for hyper sbm uh kesson stigma is tight for three and four and it looks like it's not going to be tight for above seven so five and six is uh, we don't know and again this is not physics simulation right it's not conjecture so we need Florent to tell us what is the physics uh, you know inspired answer but this is actually what we can prove so far Okay, so, right, so I wanted to spend, I guess, so how much time do I have? Like, this is 55, that's about, about 20, 20 minutes, right, or even more. Okay, right, so I think, I, so I wanted to spend the time on proving two results, or showing you the, the proof of uh, two results, unless there's any question about the, uh, this, and then at the end, I will show some open problems, which hopefully are interesting as well. Um, Okay. All right. So let me tell you. Okay. So this is the this is the theorem with the Chia Tian Yu. Uh, okay. So for two SBM with survey or without survey, there exists at most one non-trivial fixed point. So meaning the solution of this. Again, I say non-trivial because, as I said, right, this always has a solution which is trivial channel, right? Okay. And uh, so this is first fact, right? That the number of solutions is one or zero. Or non trivial. Okay, so and then starting from any non trivial M, we have that these iterations converge to M star, so this non trivial fixed point if it exists, or to trivial solution, right? So, so this is uh, this is the this is the statement, okay? And as I said, previous work already explained the where the phase transition between existence of non trivial fixed point and non existence of non trivial point, right? We already know this. This is exactly the Keston stigma D lambda square equals one. Right. Okay. So I'll I'll introduce this idea now, and then I'll I'll go over it again. But uh, the main uh, the main ideas are to think of BPM as operation on channels. We we think of a particular. I mean, this is a very natural thing for information theorists because we always try to compare channels. Which channel is better? So we use this channel comparison. Then there is this amazing stringy tree lemma, which in our language can be said that this is kind of like sub like it's, a, it's it's it tells us how does this bp operation computes with application of binary symmetric channel right so it tells you that you know if you apply bp to m a corrupted whose input is corrupted by bsc epsilon you always get a better channel than you first apply bpm with bsc epsilon so the only thing we needed to prove in in all of this theorem right is that this inequality is actually sharp you don't just get uh, you get strictly worse channel basically by doing this. And then after some massaging, we, we 
can define a metric dm m prime between channels. It's a crazy metric. I mean, we can't compute it, but you know, we can define it. It's uh, it's there. Okay, I should say, yeah, we can compute it, but we just didn't try. It. So um, right, and then BP operator shrinks this metric, not multiplicatively, but uh, it, it strictly decreases it. And then there's some theorem from 60s that under this case, first of all, it's clear that there's can only be one fixed point, right? But also you have convergence. Uh, you have compact. Or uh, <laughs> quantitative balance? Not from all like, No, absolutely not. Yeah. So that's a uh, yeah, that's a sad, uh, sad consequence, right? I like that. So, uh, so the the person who asked me exactly the same question was Alistair Sinclair. At exactly this moment in this talk, he said, "I want quantitative balance." <laughs> so, yeah. Anyways, right. So, so I'll, I'll talk more. I mean, this is a really simple proof. I mean, we're we're not like this crazy probabilists, right? We only do simple stuff. So, it's very simple proof. I'll show it. <laughs> Oh yeah, and by the way, who cares about this? So it turns out that, I mean, in the paper we said we closed this six conjectures, <laughs> and now you can say we closed, I mean, Elkanon closed with this yesterday another conjecture, right? So it's something about TC0, which I don't understand what it is, but uh, apparently it is also helpful for that. Okay, so, right, so now hypergraph SBM, again, we'll talk more, but I don't know if I'll have time, so I just wanted to flash it here now. So, there's this hypergraph stochastic block model, right? In the stochastic block model, we plant edges, which are slightly more dense between the same community. In hypergraph SBM, we just plant hyper edges slightly more often, right? If all the colors are the same. So that's what you need to know. Um, so there is a work from 2021, which shows that if, if, the Kesten if you're above Keston Stigum bound, then you can reconstruct. And what we proved is that for three and four, you can all, this is a sharp transition. Uh, okay, so what is cool here is that the previous proofs for, for the standard SBM proceed by something which is called strong data processing inequality. And it corresponds to contraction in a line kind of graph, right? You have some random variable U goes to S goes to Y, and then you want to prove that mutual information always contracts, no matter how complicated U is, it contracts by some coefficient. So for two SBM, you can prove this with no, with fixed px, without fixed px. You can use KL information. You can use high square information. You can use symmetric KL. Any information works for two SBM, right? What's cool about hyper SBM and what's special is that, first of all, this kind of inequality doesn't work. We had to introduce something that is called, which we call multi-terminal SDPI, which is a cool thing, I think, independently. And somehow of all of these three choices, only symmetric KL works. So it's like a magical matching between lots of things which we don't understand, but it gives us the right proof. Right, and why is it? Why do we care? Because it kind of tells us uh, that there is a phase. Oh, the, we also prove that uh, for R above seven, KS is non-tight for broadcasting on hyper trees, but not for, we don't know if for SBM. Um, and I like this in particular because, I mean, again, HSBM is a little further away from sort of my excitement area, my ex, what excites me. But LDPC is low density parity check codes, right? Are they operate in a similar manner? They also like broadcasting on uh, locally look like broadcasting on hyper trees with different channel though. So this is kind of a useful technique, hopefully there as well. All right, so let me, so I wanted to spend time uh, showing you the proof for the two SBM, if, if people are okay, without their rate. Of course. Yeah. Okay, so I need to define this concept called BMS channel. So BMS channel is a binary input channel which satisfies a certain symmetry condition. So what is the symmetry condition? It means that if you input plus one, it generates some probability distribution, and then if you input minus one, then there is it corresponds to just by the space, right? So like doing some uh, say sign flip on the space. So the most the most standard example is a channel which flips its input with probability delta. Right, so we call it BSC delta, and I will draw it like this because I'm an engineer and I like to draw boxes with arrows. Okay, so so this is one example of binary symmetry of BMS channel, right? So what's the other example? Well, the other example is our friend tree channel, right? So if you start from here and you propagate this bead down this pinball kind of thing, right? So then here you get some distribution on the leaves, and if you start with the opposite label, right, you can you will get exactly the same distribution on minus the leaves. Right, just from a symmetry, right? So this is a definitely a channel with symmetry, BMS channel, right? Okay, 
Okay, so here's another thing that gets information theorists excited. So if you give me two channels, right? I want to I want to understand something about them, right? So how do you like you give me, for example, this tree channel and the BSC channel, right? Which one of them is better, right? I want to get a gut feeling for it. So there are many different uh, ways to say which one is better, but the one we need here is what we call black hole preorder or degradation preorder. So I'm saying that you know Z is a better channel than Y if you can totally simulate Y channel by you know by degrading Z in some way, right? There is some stochastic map, right? Okay, so right in some sense, I mean you can see that then this means that the Y channel, right? When you in, do inference about posterior, right? It's a kind of convex combination of the posteriors of the Z channel, right? So that's uh, right. And so one example is a WK plus one, right? Because you can just right, so the, the input of depth k tree, depth k plus one can be obtained from the depth k tree, right? By just uh, simulating the extra layer, right? So this is a, like monotonically degrading, decreasing sequence of channels, right? That's uh, that's our uh, right. Okay, so right, so again, this is what I was just saying, right? So we can build wk plus one channel, right, in this way as well, right? So we have wk. Right, so this is what Elkanan was talking about, right? So when I use this here, I use the fact that WK plus one is WK plus the bottom, right? But now I write it in a different way, right? I say that WK is also the, is also D copies of w, WK plus one is D copies of WK plus a hat on top, right? Kind of thing. So you can view the same WK plus one for different purposes, right? So one shows you monotonicity, another shows you this recursive construction, right? Okay. Uh, right. Yeah, and this operation BP mu right just tells me that okay, so it constructs out of a channel mu, right? This channel, right? So when I write BP mu, a picture is in my engineering head, right? Is this one, right? If you if you write me BP mu, is this guy, right? Who inputs a bit, copies it d times, degrades it by delta flip, and then passes through the mu channel and obtains this d outputs, right? This is a BP mu channel. Yeah, so okay, so now you can be again, if you're an information theorist, right? If you think about channels your entire life, you can be a little bit more excited because fixed point is a kind of like this crazy property of infinite divisibility, right? It's a kind of infinitely divisible channel. You take this channel, right? Think about what is BP mu equals mu, right? It's a crazy situation, right? You take this channel, it takes a bit, produces some like crazy output, right? And then you say, okay, what if I copy it d times and submit to it? Inputs, right, which are noisy versions of the of the input bit, right? And then to your shock, right, you observe that this you got exa back exactly the same channel you started with, right? So that didn't become slightly better or slightly worse, right? It's exactly balanced. It's kind of like infinite divisibility, right? Property. Oh yeah, and uh, throughout this construction, I mean, mu can also like have a, a side information here, right? The survey, right? Okay. Right, so this is the statement, right? As I said, it closes a bunch of conjectures. Uh, I don't know, sorry, I, I just, uh, right, I think, yeah, this was, uh, yeah, so these are the conjectures, some of the conjectures which it closes, but let me not spend time on this. R rather, let me just uh, uh, show you the, the, the main steps of the proof. Okay, so here's a famous result from this paper uh, in 2000. Uh, uh, right, so, okay, so what these guys showed is they said that, okay, if you have any pair of channels, mu and nu, you input a bit, and you first flip the bit, then copy it, and then pass it through those guys. This is always worse than first copying the bit, then flipping it twice, and then passing it through, right? Sounds completely obvious, right? Come on, it's clear, right? I mean, here you degrade the bit right away, right? And here you give it two chances to pass, so it's obvious. So I think this has a funny story, which I'll come on maybe tell, will tell you later. But uh, it's, it's, yeah. <laughs> because there are two versions, right? <laughs> Anyways, but uh, yeah. So basically, El Kanan's I think first uh, first uh, uh, first uh, sort of exposition to this was to try to prove this for query, and uh, it actually doesn't hold for beyond binary. Just to explain that this is not an obvious statement, right? So for it only holds for binary, right? So okay. Right, so this is explanation. And basically, if you play with this, you can see that 
this is how EKPS proved that uh, KS bound is tight here, just by basically progressively pushing all the channels down through this, and then you keep getting better, better channel. In the end, you get the channel with the K branches from the top, and then on each branch you have this like sequence of BSC. BSCs, right? And then you can just compute for that channel. You can compute explicitly what's the reconstruction probability, right? So that's how they that's how they prove that, among others. Okay, so what did we prove again? So I will not prove this. This is a hard stuff. I mean, and not elegant for proving. But what we proved is that you can also do the same theorem, right? So when you push any BSC down the branches, you get a stress. You get a bit better channel, right? But, but you even get a better channel, even if you add a little bit of uh, uh, coin flip, sorry, a little bit of epsilon noise on top. So we call this strictly better channel, right? So not, so clearly this is, you know, can be upper bounded by this without epsilon, right? But uh, this is even better in the sense. Okay, so, um, right. Okay, so, Right, so, oh, yeah, right. So there, there's a difficulty that this actually, as stated, so there are several diff differences. First of all, this is only for the same new here. This does not hold if you allow new and new, like, like they have. And second thing is it doesn't hold. So just to explain to you that this is a little hairy proof, right? It only holds for degree bigger than three. For two, it doesn't hold uh, for some special reason, but it holds if you apply this twice. Like if you do two steps and you get a four -y thing. Then it applies. So then, anyway. So that's, yeah. Um, okay. So now, it turns out that this lemma implies something. We, I will show it in the next slide. But it implies this version. So it tells you that for any mu, and for any phi bigger than zero, there exists some epsilon such that if you apply BP mu and do composition after, then this is strictly uh, this is better than BP mu composed with BSC phi and you can add a little bit of noise here, right? So notice that, again, this is a better bound, right? But than, than you expect without this. Okay, so, right. So, so here's an interesting definition then. You take any pair of channels, new and new, and you ask, okay, so if I start adding more and more noise to new, right? It becomes worse and worse and worse and worse, right? And eventually it will go down uh, under new, right? In this partial order. Right, so the smallest number which you need to make mu worse than new, right? So you basically move down this partial order until you hit something below, uh, below new, right? You call this phi star. It's not symmetric in mu and mu, right? It's, uh, um, but it can be one half. It cannot be one half because yeah, one half always works, right? But it will not be one half uh, if new is non-trivial. Because you can always uh, take phi to be probability of reconstruction error for mu. But if one of the two is an erasure channel, can I get worse? Yeah. So, so, so basically, phi, so phi here can always be taken to be, so let's take new, right? This is a channel. So it's probability of error. If it's one half, then yes. The best phi you can get is one half. Say, it's the that, bottom. Let's say that the mu is an erasure channel. Yes. And mu instead is a binary symmetry. Sure. Yes, so there exists some phi which is not one half. Yeah. And it's going to be bigger than delta. So here. I understand that. You understand how? So if it's an erasure channel with positive probability, you see the, the real number. And in that case, you fix it. Yeah. So it's, yeah, it's, uh, I mean, there is also some visual picture I can give in terms of like, but that's uh, yeah. But it's a good question, right? So it's not trivial that phi is not one half here, right? Because one half is always like the worst, right? You want to be slightly less than one half. Okay, so so here's how you do it, right? You say, okay, now define this mu and nu, right? So then, okay, so so I mean, because this is worse than nu, right? BP is monotone. I mean, you can check this, right? So so then BP is less than BP nu, right? Okay, so then you apply this BSC epsilon here to both sides. Then you apply this our strong STL, right? And it tells us that this is upper bounded by this, but lower bounded by this, right? It's precise of the statement, right? Okay. And so then, uh, okay. So, I mean, there's one cheat here, right? That 
I want to tell you that you can actually cancel epsilon. I mean, it, it requires some proof, but uh, it actually is true. Like you can always also almost divide by BSC epsilon, get phi minus epsilon here. It's going to be minus epsilon prime here, right? And so what this tells you is that, I mean, if you if you believe that you can cancel this epsilon here, right? And you got some some value which is phi minus epsilon, but this violates the minimality of, of the condition, which means that phi should have been zero all along, right? And then uh, because phi is zero, right? Ah, sorry, this is the next slide, I think. Right. So the, the point is that so this is a rigorous statement. Sorry, this yeah, this is a rigorous statement. Forget about sorry, I, I'm getting ahead of myself. So this is a proof, right? So it tells you that if you apply BP, then like the degradation index slightly decreases a little bit. Okay. So now we go to the fixed point, right? Okay. So we, we, we prove this, that if this is bigger than zero, then the degradation index decreases. Okay. So now if these two are fixed points, right? And these are the same. So you violated minimality, right? So what's the only assumption that we made? We, we assume that uh, the phi is uh, positive. Right, so this means phi is zero. So this means like mu is less than nu, and by symmetry, nu is less than mu. Right, that's roughly that's it. That's like the only, the only thing you need to do. Okay, so right, and again, so so if you know this, I mean, when you compose BSC channels, then what is multiplicative is not the probability, but one minus two epsilon. That's the probability of the flip. So when you concatenate two channels, then you get like a product of this one minus two epsilons. For this reason, it's natural to define the symmetric measure, which is like log one over one minus two phi, phi star. And then you can check it satisfies triangle inequality, it's symmetric. And uh, then this argument just tells you that D is strictly contractive here. Again, this is very far from any kind of, uh, you know, distances that uh, we considered in any other proofs before. So yeah so that's uh right okay so i owe you this this proof which is very engineering proof that's I, so i somehow i mean what, what i was trying to convince in this is not like this details but the fact that it's natural to solve this problem if you think about it as we do by connecting you know boxes by R and arrows so let me show you this proof okay so so this guy right is is this picture right it's BSC phi followed by D copies and BSC delta and then pass it for the move, right? So this is my channel, right? Okay, so, so our improved string tree lemma says that when you push this BSC down, right? You can insert slight epsilon here on top, right? Okay, so let's do this, right? Okay, so we prove this. Okay, so, so here's a cool fact here. Right, so now we get this picture. So we prove that this is upper bounded by this. Okay, so this is a commutativity property here, right? So this is somehow where the binary enters the picture, right? You interchange this BSC P with BSC delta, right? Okay, and now of course what happens is now you look at this picture and you say, oh geez, this is like my uh, argument mu composed BSC P, right? And this is just B, BP mu BSC P, right? So I'm not lying. This is actually how we came up with this proof by like drawing these boxes and thinking hard about what happens when you push down pushes boxes around, right? I don't know, maybe some people can discover it by just manipulating these identities, but I feel like at least for us, this was a natural thing. Right, so I'm not going to try to prove this uh, lemma, but uh, yeah, improve the STL. It's, yeah, it's like there's lots of cases. Yeah, so anyways, it's not uh, nice. Any questions about this? And I'll, otherwise I'll use the five minutes to tell you about hyper SBM a little bit. Yes. <laughs> yeah, very good. So Elkanan will tell you the string. So you see, I mean, everything in our in our thing, right, depends on uh, on uh, on improving this result, right? So if this result doesn't hold, then forget about improved version of this as well, right? Why this result doesn't hold? I don't have good intuition, except that uh, well, Elkanan couldn't do it, and then he showed the counter example. So, <laughs> so yeah. But it would be, I mean, yeah, we tried a lot. Uh, but uh, so this shows BP uniqueness, BP stability, boundary relevance. As I said in the beginning, we also, Yudro showed the, the, it for ternary and quaternary and for all others by, by a completely different method. It also uses degradation, but in a very different manner. So, yes. 
I don't know. This is actually a good question. Good question. Yes. But I think, okay, I think we definitely checked with Tian that, yeah, I think our improved thing is false. So, okay, I can tell you why it's also impossible to, to, to prove. Like, I mean, I don't have chops to do this. So the way we do it is by, is by associating to every BMS channel a convex in monotonically increasing curve, which we call beta curve. I wouldn't remember the definition right now, but it's basically probability of error under different priors on the input. Like as you change different prior on the input, right? You get different probability of error. So it's kind of like, and then you can, in a certain reparameterization, you get a convex curve where degradation is, corresponds to a monotone relation. Just one is above another. So strictly, so actually, right? So degradation exactly corresponds to the fact that one channel has a strictly better probability of error for all priors, right? So that's that's this fact. Now, and then our proof goes through analysis of like different edge cases, like, okay, I mean, every channel. So applying BSC, for example, corresponds to homotety here. And then you just showed it, okay, all homotety, like this touches here, then it has to be, there has to be some gap. That's why you can insert an epsilon. But once you go to 2D, right, you have to think about convex surfaces. Now they can, right, they can like touch each other in many different ways, right? Here, you, if you touch, like you basically need to touch, okay, they all become linear eventually. And then you only need to check like, okay, what's the end point here, end point here, and then like, you know, some, some something. But, uh, but for, con I mean, I, we, yeah. But I think we also numerically checked that it doesn't hold for, but it's a good question. I mean, I don't have an example from the top of my head. Okay, do you remember your example for counter exam? Does it have mu equals new? For, for other model, for like model? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Oh, so, yeah. so mu equals mu, mu equals mu also has a counter. Yeah. Right? Okay, so yeah, that's, I remember it was kind of a bummer when we did this, like, oh, can we do this? No, but uh, for HSBM, maybe, maybe we can do that because it's binary model. But again, Yudro has some simulations which kind of killed my hope for this. So anyways, let me tell you maybe half a minute just to drop an idea uh, on HSBM. Sorry, is it is it okay? Right, right. Um, right. So, so in HSBM, right, we plant a hyper edge, u one up to u r with probability a and choose r minus one or b and choose r minus one. Right. This is just to keep the degree constant. Right. That's normalization. Again, you want to do overlap. Uh, okay. So the question is. Uh, what is the local structure here? So, okay, so the local structure is what we call Bocht, broadcasting on the hyper trees. Uh, okay, <laughs> Canon is like, oh no, not again. <laughs> so, right, so how does the broadcasting on hyper trees? So, what's the, what's the twist here? So, before, when the condition on the input, these two outputs are generated uh, independently, condition independently, right? Now they are correlated. Right, and, and and then again, you get, so I'll show you how they are correlated on the next slide, but the idea is that, okay, you start with this, you generate two of these guys in a coordinated fashion, then they then they go to live their own life, right, after this, right? But the, but when you generate them here, right, the two subtrees are not conditionally independent given rho, right? They're conditionally independent given u and v, right? But not... Uh... But it's not like all your children. Like, like maybe you have 10 children. Ten children. Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. Sorry. So, yeah, yeah. You could. You, you mean there could be one guy here, and then he would have his own things. Yes. Like in, in the picture, like all my children. Yeah, you throw one eye for. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> also, you say maybe for other densities, you can like you can have like things like this. Uh, I think I was just trying to make sure. Yeah, so I think for other density of edges, I mean, but just in this local tree-like situation, right? I mean, you don't have these edges. Yeah. I think it's just that in the picture, every vertex has one belong in a single hyper edge. That's right. Is that right? Oh, yes, 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 I see. Yeah, 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 of course, yes. Yeah. Okay, so, right, yeah. So there's, there should be degree D here, yes, right. Okay, so, right, so now we, we, we can ask the same question, and okay, so basically, right, so this is the broadcasting channel here. So you generate, if your input is X, 
you generate uniform string from all two to the r minus one, right? Except you slightly prefer when all of them are equal to the input, right? So that's uh, that's the type of correlation uh, you embed in this. Um, okay, and the, the theorem here is this, right? So if r minus one d lambda square is less than one, then you don't have reconstruction. So r minus d times, uh, right? So this is just a, like the number of children, right? Uh, so, and uh, right, so, Anyways, as we wrote in the abstract, we admit that case R equals four depends on the numerical verified inequality. I guess one day we'll have it verified formally. But uh, yeah, so anyways, I have to put this. Uh, right, and so for what's interesting here is that when R is bigger than seven, then there exists reconstruction below chaos, right? So it's a binary model and uh, you, can, you can still have reconstruction below chaos. Okay, so, but let me tell you, right, okay, let me skip. Let me skip this. Okay, so right. So as I said, right. So all the proofs on the usual uh, broadcasting entries depend on bounding this ratio between mutual information, uh, you know, from u to y and from u to x, right? So you can bound it either with knowledge of px or without knowledge of px, and uh, you know. This is basically, so this channel is always BSC for us. So these values are always, for example, one minus two delta squared. Uh, okay. Or lambda squared. Right. Okay. So now if you prove that, then you can prove that so if, you, if you know this broadcasting channel, right? If you know this, this contraction coefficients, you can prove this result that if D times the reconstruction, uh, times the contraction coefficient is less than one, then you have non reconstruction. How does this work? You just compute mutual information between this and these guys. So because of conditional independence, this mutual information is upper bound by the sum of this guy plus this, this guy plus this. And then you treat all of this as U. This is X and this is Y, right? So you apply this contraction to the reverse channel and that's it. And then just induct and you can see that uh, it contracts at speed D eta, right? So some, I mean, I put this as our theorem. I mean, there are versions of this theorem which are, you know, which exist, but this is just, the one which is the sharpest for some settings. It's it's a mild variation. It's not a yeah. It's it's not like a super uh, super novel thing. But uh, what is novel is that for if you apply the same kind of thinking, you see now we have a channel which has r minus one correlated outputs. So you can you can view and then like your u correlations, right? You can view all of these guys as like one big u, right? And not put any structure here. This would be the regular SDPI. Then this doesn't work. But what we noticed is that if you put, if you if you recognize that you know there's there is a special structure that you know there's a bunch of U's and they all get processed by you know the same DMS channel. So this is a special kind of contraction. So then we define this what we call multi-terminal SDPI coefficient, and we evaluated it for you know for uh, uh, for the pots. Sorry, for the hypertree pots channel, right? And then it gives us the correct contraction. Right. So surprisingly. So, so are there connections to like, I mean, there are all these like Tim Austin style, like dual, dual total correlation or other types of balance. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. So that's, uh, yeah, I mean, maybe, I don't know. Uh -huh. That's, uh, yeah, so that the total correlation is scale divergence between yeah. the joint and the product of marginals. Right. Yeah, so uh, could be, I don't know, yeah. But in any case, so this is like one one idea, right? But then when we tried it, it still didn't work. What worked is we also needed to replace mutual information but something called SKL mutual information, which is the sum of KL divergence, the normal part and the reverse part. <laughs> and for this version, that's the magical part, right? So that's the that's the discovery here. Okay. So anyway, so let me let me thank everyone. So I guess I'll have. Uh, I'll have uh, some open problems here. I don't have time to discuss them, but I would say the coolest one is uh, KS is tied for Q equals three. This is conjecture, right? For all parameters, broadcasting on trees or SBM, right? So, uh, but even for three colorings, right? Like you do it three coloring on the tree, right? The, the, the question is, is the critical degree four is open, right? Come on, guys, and it's so smart. So many smart people here, right? And you have to try to do this. Uh, Right. So anyways, so there are, yeah, there are a bunch of other things, but yeah, I already out. Thanks. <laughs>